My name is Anna Maria Sigaris. I am a professor and the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Nursing. I'm a nutritionist by background, um, and so that's why I'm involved with um, the Food Sustainability Task Force. And let me introduce to you um, the rest of our panel here. So we have Elaine Bailey. Raise your hand. Um, so Elaine is um, a clinical psychologist, and she is actually um, certified in behavioral sleep medicine by the American Board of Sleep Medicine. And she joined the CAPS program here at UVA in 2013. Um, and so she's going to be talking to us. I have questions for each one, um, more related to sleep, which is her specialty. Then we have Zen Yang, who is a professor in cardiovascular medicine. He has um, um, a PhD from vascular biology in the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. And um, Dr. Zen's work focuses more on the molecular and singular mechanism skeleton muscle. He's very interested in the effect of exercise and healthy aging. Um, and then we have Michael Mason right here to my, to my left. Um, Michael um, ha is here, um, has been working in the Student Health Counseling Psychological Services Department. And he's a staff psychotherapist, and he's the liaison to our African American Affairs here in the community. And then we have our man, Amanda Trillio. Amanda? Amanda. Amanda, I'm sorry. <laughs> I always want to you know, Italianize or Spanishize the names here. Um, she's a registered dietitian and an author. Um, she also has a master's degree in sustainable food systems, so I think it's going to be very interesting to hear um, some of her um, viewpoints here and answer some of your questions. And then we have um, Dr. Susanna Williams, um, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing. Her area is in mindfulness, and she's also the um, associate director of the UVA Mindfulness Center. And my last person is my darling friend, uh, Dr. Paul Friedman, who is the Associate Chair of um, Political Science. He also is a member of the Food Sustainability Task Force. He also does a lot of teaching on food politics. And so we are just delighted to have everybody here, and I want to thank you very much. I thought I'd get the panelists started um, by asking each one of them a question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, and so I've got one for each panelist member that really relates to their area of expertise. And so I wanted to talk, start with Paul. Um, so Paul, you're very much interested in food politics, and you know this movie talks about the importance of eating fresh fruits and vegetables, and we saw examples of different um, low-income neighborhoods and communities are trying to increase the accessibility of these particular foods. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more for us about how poor people especially dis are disadvantaged by our subsidies for processed foods. Great move. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Great question. Um, so I really appreciated uh, hearing from um, Stephen Ritz, who it runs that program uh, in the Bronx, uh, in part because I'm from the Bronx, and in part because I work with an organization here in Charlottesville called City School Yard Garden. And what we do here in Charlottesville is what Ritz and um, the, the folks in that uh, segment were doing, helping kids to uh, appreciate that food comes out of the ground, that, that as Wendell Berry says, eating is an agricultural act, and it's um, particularly if you're living in an urban environment, easy to uh, forget that. Um, we frequently hear uh, people bring up the cost of healthy food, um, and it's often, it seems like it's, it's often a conversation stopper, right? Well, healthy food is so expensive, it's out of the reach of, of, of people who need access. And I'm always, I, I find that really frustrating, right? Sometimes it's like a gotcha, gotcha, right? So we can stop talking about healthy food. Um, what I appreciated about this film is that it was a conversation starter, right? So the question was, all right, how can we address this? And part of that, uh, part of that inevitably has to do with addressing perceptions, right? And sometimes it's education, right? And in fact, it can be less expensive to eat in healthy ways than to eat in, uh, uh, in unhealthy ways, uh, but sometimes that requires not just education uh, about facts, it requires education about food, about things that are, you, again, we saw in the film, food preparation, 
right? If I don't know what to do with food, if I don't know what the food is, if I don't know a kale or a kohlrabi, well, you can give me all the kale and kohlrabi you want, I, I'm not gonna eat it, right? Um, so I need, we need to think about addressing um, knowledge gaps, right? And, and not just income gaps, although income gaps is a huge uh, piece of it. The other thing I wanna say is uh, a point made, a number of points throughout the film, uh, Marion Nessel, um, and I learned the hard way, it's not Marion Nestle, I thought for years, but in fact, um, uh, it's Marion Nestle. She, she says the government is up to its ears in food policy, and that's absolutely the case, right? Why is it that processed foods have such ready availability to cheap ingredients like soy-based and corn-based sugars and other ingredients? Well, it's because our tax dollars are subsidizing that. Right? We make it less expensive for food processors to make food that is less healthy for us. And so Michael Pollan is absolutely right to say we vote with our forks, but we also vote with our votes. And we need to remember that. The administration just released its new budget and it calls for tens and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in cuts to SNAP benefits, to food stamps benefits um, over the next few years. That's something that we need to pay attention to, and that's something that we need to connect with many of these issues. Thank you, Paul. So Amanda, as a registered dietitian, I'm sure you get um, some of these kinds of questions, but I thought, you know, in the movie, they made several points about the fact that we should be, we should not be talking, talking about components of food. We should be talking about food itself. And it's interesting that you know the, the most recent dietary guidelines that I was able to serve on that committee made a shift from talking about individual nutrients to foods and dietary patterns to really get Americans thinking along those lines. But can you tell us a little bit more about the concept of, um, of why talking about foods will decrease the confusion we have in our society about what to eat? Yeah, absolutely. So we live through food. We don't live through calcium or boron or manganese. Um, when we go to the grocery store on our grocery list, we don't have like vitamin D, iron, boron. We have milk, bread, butter, cheese. So if we start just focusing on those food components or those nutrients, it's a lot more of a learning curve. And, you know, as humans, we're just so busy, we're always stressed about life, work, and I don't think food is something that we should also stress about. So whenever I'm talking to people about, you know, how to change their diet and how to incorporate more healthful foods, we're always talking about the specific foods because no one wants to go around memorizing exactly what a broccoli has or what bread has in it. We just want to know about that specific food. Because um, again, because that's how we live. So we want to act the way we live, and we want to live by the way we live. So by um, talking about food, it makes it more personable. And as from the video, you can tell we eat a lot for more reasons than just because of nutrition. We eat because for social, we eat for culture. We eat sometimes just for a celebration, and that's OK. And so when we're focusing more on that, we could live healthier lives and it won't be confusing by all the media and go to the grocery store because the grocery store now has like, what, 20,000 food products there. So no wonder why, you know, it could take people hours just to filter through the grocery store. But if we know what food we want and what food we need to eat to make ourselves feel better, then going grocery shopping and preparing foods will not be as complicated. Great. Thank you. So, um, Zen. You know, the messages that we got um, from Michael Pollan, the last one was really, don't eat too much. And it's really a focus of the energy balance equation. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, because your specialty is on exercise. So can you tell us about the connection between exercising and what you eat, and how that can contribute to us being healthy and fit? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the exercise topic is not the topic today, but um, as you know that most of the schools and when they talk about exercise, nutrition and exercise often are in the same department. Um, 
Um, exercise, uh, since um, ancient time, we all know that the, the main purpose of exercise is to uh, improve uh, performance and to get more food and you know, run faster and uh, hunt better. Uh, but uh, there is um, a positive impact of exercise, probably synergistically working with uh, better nutrition. Um, we all know now that right now is a pandem pandemic surge of uh, chronic diseases. Um, neurodegenerative disease, disease, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, every one of them can be benefited from exercise. Um, and with a holistic intervention, with exercise and nutrition and body-mind, that's the only way we can prevent those diseases. Well, that's a perfect lead-in then to Elaine Bailey and her um, specialty. So while the movie doesn't address sleep, we have now um, become more aware of the importance of sleeping and the effect it actually has both on our weight and our overall health. And so Elaine, there's been a couple of you know, recent media releases um, about the link between um, sleep quality and refined carbohydrates. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And yeah, I just hearing you talk about the exercise, I kept on thinking like, oh, and that's something that we use in sleep hygiene too, and sleep, the link between um, exercise and diet and sleep, and this is definitely a whole person kind of thing. Um, so to the refined carbohydrates, yes, we're finding that, um, that that can lead to more disrupted sleep, and then in turn, more disrupted sleep can interfere with certain hormones like ghrelin and leptin, which manage our how full we feel and our appetite drives and so it can get to be this whole spiral um so i think thinking about the whole person the other thing that i wanted to say on sleep um or that's really struck me about seeing this movie was how he's talking about that wonder bread and the more that was both a solution and a problem in one because we had had all this technology and that's something we see in my field too we have all this great technology, but it's inter done a lot to interfere with our natural rhythms and so on. So I think getting back to I think the bigger picture is just thinking about what we're meant to do as humans. Um, one of the things that people can do when they're having sleep problems, there was a recent study that came out was to go camping because all of a sudden you're, you're tuned to the natural rhythms of sun coming up, sun going down, and you put away your technology. So. Perfect. I love how this panel is sort of leading themselves to each other in terms of the questions. So Susanna um, Williams, you know, um, I loved Michael Pollan's quote about try to spend as much time enjoying the meal as it took to prepare it. Just think about all of us who prepared a Thanksgiving meal, right? And it's taken us all day long and it's gone in an hour. But um, I think, you know, that, that concept between, you know, sort of, um, enjoying your food, being more mindful, is something that we're now coming back to in terms of actually using it as a behavior strategy. Can you talk a little bit more about why mindful eating is related to feeling healthier? Sure. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, with awareness, um, which is really uh, the essence of mindfulness. Oh, it is. I guess I wasn't close enough. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so as I was saying, um, I think a lot of it has to do with awareness, which is an essential element of mindfulness. Um, so we teach, well, I teach this uh, mindful eating program, and one of the things that, um, that I teach is to actually tune into yourself. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, we're, we're pretty much you know, kind of from the neck up, we're very head-oriented, very cognitive-oriented, and we've almost forgotten, like, you know, the messages we get from our body, such as, you know, hunger. I mean, am I, am I hungry? Um, so teaching people to tune into, what does hunger feel like? And then what does it feel like um, to have enough satiety? Um, you know, it could be flavor satiety, like, you know, there's only so many Brussels sprouts you can eat. I love Brussels sprouts. There's also, oh, there's, uh, there's only a certain amount of chocolate you can eat. I know, because I've tried. Um, and then it's just like,
like, I don't want anymore. So before you get to that place, learning how to tune in to um, your hunger, your fullness, the actual taste of the food. Um, I loved the, um, the pictures he had of how we eat. You know, we're on the phone, we're eating something, we're walking, we're eating something, we're driving, we're eating, you know, and that is what we do. Um, so another piece is, I also love what he said about the French culture. You know, our culture, mm, you know, has maybe not led us down the right path in so many ways, um, but it is true about the French. I remember um, I did a bike trip, this 10-day bike trip in France. It was, gosh, probably 10 years ago. But, you know, we'd ride, and then, you know, when we'd be, like, done, um, it'd be, like, you know, 2.30 or 3.00, and would be like, okay, let's go have lunch. And there, there, was, there was no place open for lunch. And we were like, what is this? You know, this is like, how can there not be food? And, you know, they were just like, kind of that same way back to us, like, what is your problem? Lunch is over, you know? <laughs> We've already had lunch. And it was just such a shocking change in culture for me to, you know, that these people actually all ate at lunchtime. Um, and then, you know, the length of time at the table, wow. Um, so we really could learn a lot from the French. Um, so I would say awareness, you know, tuning in to your own um, feelings and also to the awareness of the food. You know, that beautiful food, uh, the pictures of the vegetables and all the different colors and stuff. You know, really treating ourselves, you know, from a sensorial point of view um, as opposed to just mindlessly, you know, the way we usually do. So, yeah. So, now, Michael, um, you get the university question, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you're our best university representative here. Um, but I think it's important um, for us to sort of understand and our audience to understand is how is the university being responsive to providing students with the healthiest food possible? And in addition, um, how are we sort of responding to students who are struggling with eating disorders? Because those are sort of like two things where all of a sudden, you know, um, become major issues for um, institutes of higher education. Wow. I think the question got a little more pointed in translation than the <laughs> So with that, I need to give a little bit of a caveat. I'm, a, I'm not an eating disorders specialist. I'm a specialist in eating, as in I like to eat. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's why I'm here. I, I do want to just sort of give two little statements, bro, before I jump into this question. Um, so let's see, where do I start? Uh, so on December 4th, no, 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 this summer I spent about three weeks in West Africa. Uh, moving through French-speaking countries. And I, you know, I don't speak French, which is obviously something I should have considered before I <laughs> left. Uh, but I never felt as an American so disadvantaged, so disabled, uh, by not even being able to speak the language as I did there. Uh, until December 3rd, I woke up, had an epiphany, and declared that my family was going to become vegan. Uh, had no idea why, but that was a thing, and I did that. Um, and living in this country as a vegan is a nightmare, actually. Uh, and so I think that may, I'm not sure if it's first or second, but it's pretty complicated in this country to sort of live without the things that we're talking about in this film, for whatever reasons. Uh, so that's the first part of it. Um, I was at, uh, what is it, Five Guys this afternoon in a little dining hall, and I was trying to get some french fries, because I'm, you know, I still feed, uh, you know, salt, sugar and the ketchup and, and, and uh, fat. Uh, and one of the students laughed, he said, Dean Mason, so what you gonna get? A lettuce sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I'm gonna get what people can get it, you know, fire guy, but it was sort of thing. So that's one thing that, you know, people begin to pathologize difference. I think that's a, one of those falling pieces. The other is, you know, about a decade ago, we were having a crisis around video game addiction in this country. Uh, and I found myself in London and I was doing all this work, because they were doing all this brilliant work with uh, adolescents of video game addiction. And I was over there and I just sort of wondered and I said, you know, we, we put a lot of this on the, the, the children. 
I was like, but there are a lot of scientists who understand brain development who are creating this product. So it's not the child who's pathologized, it's the industry. And I think one of the things that the university is actively trying to do to, to this question is try to reject uh, or resist the, the urge to pathologize our students. Even though we're aware that the students are on average gaining from 7 to 15 pounds in their first semester here or something like that, it's not because they have a affinity for eating too much or they're making decisions. It's actually the industry that's sort of uh, influencing the things that are available. We're doing careful studies thinking about uh, issues related to food uh, deserts, for instance. I think that's a big thing that we're sort of thinking about. What quality and what uh, degree of access the students have to healthy choices. And I think in that respect, you know, the university is trying to do things uh, which I think mirror sort of the national platform right now in higher ed where we're thinking about things like Meatless Mondays, uh, where we're trying to come up with uh, menu strategies where students will, in, not necessarily be forced, but they'll be encouraged to explore options in the dining hall. We're thinking about uh, more clearly students who come in uh, who have uh, allergies or intolerances uh, to certain things and trying to make sure that we label the food and make, foods, uh, make sure that the foods are available. We're trying to think about uh, sustainability uh, and not just sustainability of resources, but sustainability of the sense of culture. Where is the food coming from? What food is it around us? What food exists within 50, 100, 150 miles of the university that we can provide through our cafeterias? And I think the other is, uh, I, the students asked me during this last final exam period in the fall, they said, Dean Mason, um, do you have any tips for, uh, for the students who are going through final exam, and I said, you know, if I had to give one, it would be, it's okay to eat your feelings sometimes. And the students were blown away, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, it's okay to eat ice cream, it's okay to eat chocolate, as long as you're aware that you're eating it. And I think that's a big deal, and I think the university is sort of pushing that direction. One of the things that I think we are really doing a good job and working hard to do is try to make sure that we have responsive services uh, to students who come here with, uh, you know, eating issues or eating disorders. And I think what we're gradually trying to do is uh, get in front of the curve as it relates to prevention. Uh, not necessarily just responsive work, but prevention. Uh, but I know that the student health uh, uh, eating disorder team is available for consultation and all those things. Uh, and we have an eating disorder coalition, which is a group of professionals throughout the city and the university. Uh, and I think, uh, but I think the, the area where we probably are going to grow the next decade is trying to look at the relationship between the industry push uh, in the ways that we make choices. Even in the video, you see there's so many decisions we make that we don't have control over. Uh, but I think really just trying to think about how do we understand the absence of decision making, uh, good, healthy decision making, uh, and the prevalence of some of these things that we're describing as eating disorders. So now, oh, I just wanted to kind of dovetail do. on sure. what Dean Mason I'm said. I'm going to move down here so that I can get some answers from the audience. Um, in terms of the university, another thing that we're doing is we have a new student health building coming up in a few years. And I see my colleague, Melanie, yes. um, down there. And I know that we're going to have, um, she's going to have a teaching kitchen there and maybe talking with them about a small garden or something like that. So we're working to put into place some physical ways where we can do some of this healthy food things in our university here. So. so now we have a mic available, and if you raise your hand, if you have a question, if you could just talk loudly into the mic, um, ask any one of us a question. And meanwhile, don't forget to fill out your postcard and drop it off at the table, we'll mail it to you. <laughs> Hello. I didn't know if I should stand, but I did. Um, so I was kind of concerned by a lot of the ways that they talked about certain issues, um, some being that the rules were kind of conducive to making eating disorders, and there was a lot of not fat positivity or body positivity. There's a lot of issues. But one that I wanted to focus on was um, they described a study that started with a researcher making an observation on the difference in the fibrous content between African and African-American diets 
I was alarmed by how they homogenized the entirety of the African content, suggesting that people from 54 countries and the wide variety of walks of life could possibly have the same diet and culture. Um, but the real issue I'm asking you guys is they then kind of assumed that a select group of African Americans from New York could represent African Americans at large and a small group of South Africans could possibly represent Africa at large. So I'm kind of wondering, um, since I know you're all like kind of medical professionals, how the scientific legitimacy and kind of also the ethical legitimacy of this study, um, how that makes you feel and how that makes you feel about the whole of everything presented in this documentary. Thanks. So I will um, try to address that as um, having been a nutrition scientist and an epidemiologist, which I took issue on how Marion actually responded to that question. But um, so I think you have to. Some of the information here, I think, was oversimplified in how they were actually presenting it. And so I think that's important to keep in mind. That in fact, in order to be able to take some of the scientific study that they, they were evaluating and enable it to be presented to the lay audience, they had to sort of um, extrapolate um, a little bit more than if you actually went and read the study. Okay, so, um, and while I'm not familiar with that particular study, but as an epidemiologist, I'm sure what they were actually trying to do is to be able to look at the association between, um, and they're, they're looking at the fact that there could be sort of a genetic predisposition to the interaction between diet and the risk of colon cancer. Um, and so by, by putting, you know, what they, and they might have been very um, specific in terms of saying that they went to a particular place in South Africa where individuals from New York actually migrated from or had family from and actually, you know, looked at that. But you would have to go back to the study, but I'm assuming that's probably what they did, looked at some ancestral history for the population that they looked at in the United States and try to go back and, and pick something very similar to be able to look at this effect of eating a high fiber diet on your, and of course they weren't able to look at risk of colon cancer, right? They were looking at a, a proxy of that by looking at the gut and the reaction of the gut to the, the type of um, microorganisms and the byproducts that would be um, 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 produced by the type of diet and the interaction with the microorganisms. So I don't want you to get hung up on one thing and I can totally, you're, you're right, how can you extrapolate, you know, all of one continent to a particular group of, you know, African Americans living in the United States? You can't. I think we need to dive in. I think the general thing, what they were trying to say is, and this has been shown in some other studies, is when you migrate from a country outside of the United States to the United States, that your risk for certain diseases go up compared to the individuals who end up staying in that particular country. And we've seen that pattern of risk over and over again. I don't know if anybody else wants to add. Well, I was gonna, oops, sorry, I was gonna um, comment about the whole body positivity because I definitely agree in the beginning it was when you're talking about childhood obesity, but towards the end I was, ex I was very um, pleasantly surprised that they focused, not pleasantly surprised, but just um, happy that they focused not necessarily on the kid's weight at all really, but just on his energy level. So hopefully this um, movement to, or not a movement, but just this um, act to eat more lower on the food chain and just more wholesome foods will focus less on our weight and more on our habits and how we feel. Because he was saying how we had more energy to play basketball and just run around and I think that's the most important part. And I'll just add real quickly, I also think, um, I also am always cautious when people put ethnicity first. Uh, just because we for centuries have sort of, you know, misabused 
uh, that construct. Uh, in this case, though, especially for those of us who are struggling to try to think about uh, sustainability in food, uh, there is some reality that the, uh, the environment shapes what you eat, right? So in this narrative, I don't necessarily have as much of a problem with the use of African and South African, uh, African American and South African. What I suspect, though, would be true is that if we started to try to look at the equivalent groups, so if we would say the same socioeconomic brackets, the same gen you know, general area where they live, the same kind of employment status, you know, they would probably have the same flora in their gut as would any other person in that area. So they probably could have picked whatever city that was in New York and compared it to whatever village that was in South Africa, and they would have the same results. So I think it's a little bit misleading in this case, unless they've done the genetic work, which I don't even know if they could, uh, because we don't really have the data to show that sort of migration, and I don't think they would have spent the money to do a DNA. Uh, so what I think happened in this case is that we use this ethnicity to weigh more than what it actually does in this case. Does it make sense? But I don't think they were misrepresented to say that all blacks in Africa are the same, with the same belly as the, all the Africans in the US. I don't think they were actually that reckless. Um, but you know, I can see where you're going with that. Um, an observation and then a question. Uh, first, that Michael Pollan's recommendation of a plant-based diet with meat as a garnish is exactly what Thomas Jefferson recommended over 200 years ago and the, and the uh, dietary ideal that he lived by. Of course, the, food, the vegetables that he ate and were grown at Monticello were organic. Um, and I know that the movie mentioned organic once. Um, and we know that sustainability and nutritional quality comes from uh, soil quality, and we don't get it without soil quality, and our food system in this country has destroyed soil quality. Um, so I'd like the panel to uh, respond, both with respect to what's happening at the university in terms of nutritional quality and organics, and, um, and what they would like to see uh, in this area that maybe hasn't been seen yet. I want to talk about organic. I want to talk about, unless you want to talk about this, the university specifically. So I'll say what, so good, and, and I, I see my faces of my students who are going, oh yeah, soil, soil health, soil quality, we, we read about that. Good, keep remembering that. Um, let, let me connect it to one thing that the university is doing, um, Anne-Marie and I, um, um, and Tanya um, work together with the um, Food Sustainability Task Force, Food Sustainability Working Group Task Force, I don't know what we're called. Um, but one of the things that, um, that we're thinking about is uh, trying to learn more about how we can uh, source food at the university that's both more local but also more sustainable. One of the goals at the university that the Board of Visitors has signed on to is a carbon footprint reduction, um, equally important and perhaps more important from the perspective of uh, soil health. Uh, the university has also signed on to a pretty ambitious nitrogen footprint reduction. And what that means is if the university really wants to make good on that, um, one of the things that we will need to look at is changing the kind of food that is available in the dining halls, all right? And in particular, um, making choices that are more sustainable generally and probably more organic because that's one of the ways that you're gonna make progress towards a, uh, the reduction of a nitrogen footprint. So at the university level, that I think is one of the most important commitments that, that's been made for a very long time. And I was going to say about the whole organic is that definitely nutrition starts in our soil. So if our soil is not nutritious, then our food is not nutritious. So when I counsel clients, that's um, it's a lot. It's very important to include a diversity around a, a diversity amount of vegetables. So not just eating one specific vegetable or two specific vegetables, but really trying to get an abundant like the um, showed a rainbow of colors. 
because each nutrient does something different to our body, and then of course there's certain nutrients need another nutrient to even work effectively. So I'm always encouraging people to um, diversify their diet, include a large variety, and then of course um, when able to get local or teaching them how to just plant, you know, certain easy growing crops. Um, Cause there's a lot of really cool things you can do with container gardens that you don't need a huge farm or you can even do a little apartment. Hi, I had a question. Um, I'm a local farmer. I don't look like this normally. <laughs> I'm normally wearing my welly boots, but um, I wanted to thank everyone for being interested in food. And I think today a lot of people um, are very focused on cost uh, and forgetting that small farming is going to be a whole different scale in everything we do. Um, and there's such a, it's really hard with the echo of yourself. Can I do it without? Okay. <laughs> it's so hard. It's being taped. That's why. Connecting with food is just a really enriching experience. And I think this is a thing that's um, becoming more important as people are less interested in things and more interested in experiences. Um, and we connect with our customers by inviting them to come and they buy shares of grass-fed beef from our farm and they actually see how the cows live, they appreciate the experience, they don't eat vast amounts of meat but for them it's um, very enriching and they have an appreciation of what they're enjoying and we also grow vegetables and we educate and share that. And I think more and more people who would like to come and learn the other things we offer at farm, local farms, such as, by the way, making kombucha. <laughs> Girls in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's really an enriching thing for your life. And even after my four-year degree, the best thing I ever learned was at a local farm. Um, and I encourage you to connect with local farmers. It's, it's really enjoyable and change your life. Thank you for that comment and thank you for being here. I mean one of the things that um, I have to say that is very unique about the university um, and its situation and where we are um, geographically is the fact that we are surrounded by an abundance of um, wonderful farms and opportunities to partner with community organizations like a local food hub that actually helps to gather some of these foods from the smaller markets and make them more available both to our university but also um, James, um, James JMU, James Madison University and some of the other universities so that in fact the students can benefit from living in an environment where we are close to local farms which helps us all with food sustainability. Um, and, you know, we feel so strongly about this that I'm going to let Paul just do a two-minute pitch to let you know about what we're doing at Morven Farm with our food lab. We're doing a lot. So um, one of the things that's really excited about, exciting about Morven, um, which is a uh, university-held property just past um, Highland, just past Monticello, uh, about 15 or 20 minutes away, depending on how fast you drive, is um, the student-run farm. And so this is a one-acre farm that students have created uh, from scratch that actually works with UVA Dining, providing food uh, that many of you have had in, uh, uh, in the dining halls. Uh, they also run a CSA, and uh, they're, they're working with a, a local farmer now, Steph Myers, who's working with them in the kitchen garden. But moving forward, we've got all sorts of ideas about what we might do at this place. Um, this is a, a place where farming had traditionally um, occurred, uh, where it still occurs, but it's exactly the kind of farming that we were reading, that we were watching in, in the film. It's conventional uh, corn and soy, and so we think that there's all sorts of potential. We're, we're not Virginia Tech, we're not going to become Virginia Tech, but the idea that students might get um, experience 
learning uh, firsthand, really, with Mormon as, as a living lab is something that many of us are very excited about. Uh, we've also launched um, the creation of the Mormon Food Lab, which, if we have our way, will become the hub for many of the of the efforts, the research projects, the teaching programs that uh, that are already underway. So uh, be on the lookout for the Mormon Food Lab. I was just going to say, and the opportunity. I think one of the things that, um, the reason why we brought so many panels to represent many perspectives on whole living is the fact that food connects us to an environment. We know by spending more time in our environment, we tend to relax more, we tend to be more mindful, we tend to do more physical activity, and so therefore, and improve our mental health status. So therefore, we're really connecting all the dots on our message of, you know, you need to make a commitment to sort of embrace a holistic way of living. That while the food might, on the film might be talking about food, it really covers all these areas um, in order for us to live a much longer, healthier, high quality life. Um, any other questions or, yes? Uh, hello, I'm uh, actually one of the like coordinators for student involvement for the food lab, so if anyone is interested, come talk to me. Okay. Um, I actually had a question, um, something that troubles me in some of the talk we uh, have in the line of Pollen's work about um, conventional ag and, and conventionally produced produce and then the flip side that you kind of are offered are like going to farmers markets and some of these really innovative programs where um, kids have access to growing their own food but uh, I'm wondering about what can be done to increase health and nutritional literacy on kind of like an intermediate level when people are entering grocery stores and let's say it's not just chips and you know, beer or whatever, but they do have some produce and they're um, met with all of these differing labels, you know, cage-free, organic, all of this kind of confusing health information, or even on a basic level of like increasing literacy in terms of like nutrition facts panels. Like people don't always understand what percent of daily values is and serving size. So um, if we can't get farms into communities or they don't have access to a farmer's market, what are some realistic ways to increase literacy in grocery stores. Yeah, so one great thing um, that a lot of dietitians have done are grocery store tours, because there's nowhere better to learn about food and nutrition than the actual grocery store when you're selecting food items. So I think that's a really great way, and definitely the food label can be confusing, so just really, when you're working with, when I work with clients, just really breaking it down, um, not assuming that anyone knows that, well, that they automatically know what the serving size is. And also, with regards to like portions and servings, that could drive people nuts. I mean, there's so many different reasons why someone might be more hungry or less hungry, or some days you're just more hungry and less hungry than other days, and that's totally fine. So definitely go with like intuitive eating and like the mind-body practices. So really learning to live like less in our head, like, oh, what is like the dietary guidelines that I should eat? Like more like, okay, what does my body say I should eat? So really learning how to be more in tune with your body is definitely way, it, a good way to not be so confused by um, portions and servings. But yeah, so just, and if anyone ever gets confused about your nutrition labels, that's a great time to reach out to a nutrition professional or a teacher or someone um, who can really break it down for you. Because we want to believe that it's really simple, but unfortunately, like, there's a lot of food politics, and we start focusing on food components and nutrients rather than the food. So like we said before, it gets really complicated. But knowing that it can be simple and just not feeling afraid or to reach out to anyone or, um, just, you know, you're not alone, or anyone's not alone in, in thinking that it's a really difficult uh, thing to learn. Yeah, I just want to jump in to add one quick thing there, which is, um, and this is from the political science perspective, um, ask yourself, who wins if I'm confused, right? Who benefits if all this stuff seems so confusing I just can't figure it out, right? Um, that understanding that, understanding who benefits from people not being able to uh, make sense of this, uh, it, it, in my view, is absolutely essential in figuring out what we might do about it. Right now, 
I think we live in a world in which we can have farmers markets, urban gardens, school-based farms and, and farm-based curriculums, um, and not have crazy, confusing food messages, right? I don't think those two things are in opposition at all. I also think that um, what, what, what we're doing here is important, right? What we're doing at the university level, um, but it's also absolutely clear that equally or more important is uh, what we teach kids and, and what their experiences are like in uh, middle schools and elementary schools, right? I really like the work of that guy, Brian Wansink. I think it's really interesting. Every time I read about this guy talking about shaping the choices of school kids in the school, in the lunch line, and putting the healthy stuff first and the really bad stuff later, I ask, what, what, why did they even have that choice, right? These are little children, and get it out of the line all together. That'll cut it out. Anyway, you, obviously you push a couple of buttons here. Uh, but I think those buttons should be pushed for all of us. And I, and I, <laughs> <laughs> the nutritionist. And I, and I also want to just wonder about um, what, what is the actual education that you're looking for? You know, because this is one model here where we're sort of thinking about, you know, simplifying nutritional you know, stuff. Uh, but you also start to think about the principles of it. Uh, and one of the things that I teach, you know, a lot of the students who I work with in the community and my own children it's simple things. For instance, when we go in the grocery store and we only look on that, you know, that one right-hand corner there where they have the, the, the vegetables and to the meat or whatever if we choose that. Uh, but the idea is we'll only now buy things where I can imagine helping somebody behind the scene. Only. And that's an interesting sort of thought, right? So for the, 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 the small former, right? Here it is. If I'm not buying her produce, her form may close. I'm investing my money into someone not some corporation. Mm -hmm. And I think those sort of simple ideas, it doesn't matter the absorbing size, it doesn't matter the, all of that stuff, it's now that I'm sort of trying to reconnect to people who are providing for people. And that shifts things. And the other thing that I think is sort of interesting is, you know, we're talking about, you know, finding these small nooks and crannies to actually grow things ourselves. In this country, when I was in Africa, for instance, there were forms everywhere. Which is sort of mind-blowing, especially for those of us who haven't been before, you realize Africa is this huge continent and there's a ton of land. Uh, but the idea is that there's no land ownership, really. It all belongs to Africa. So until they want it, you can form it. If you diverse, form. Um, so there are forms everywhere. We're the opposite. You know, we have the Midwest, we have the you know, bread baskets or whatever these things are that we've sort of come up in our mind about where we situate this mass production of food. But we all are gradually becoming so disconnected to land ownership that we're being this, uh, we're, we're being hampered in our capacity to create and relate to the foods we eat. For instance, in the film, it's all about eat the things that come from the earth around you. But in reality, you know, we're surrounded by a lot of concrete, generally. Uh, so there's nothing to eat. That's just the whole idea of food desert. So I think that's one part of the education. Start of just really having people become curious about how can you establish your stake in the food cycle? How can you do that? And only invest in that. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't have pie, cake, sugar, fat, salt, all these things, as long as you have an ownership in it. And I think that's an important piece of education that actually shifts people's diet away from the middle aisles that you're sort of impugning here in the movie. Uh, but I think that's some part of it too. So I think just diversifying how we're defining the education students or people will need in order to begin to take some control over their capacity to make good decisions. I was just going to add one thing. Um, I think having food, you know, for people to try, you know, that tastes good. Uh, a lot of people, you know, we just kind of eat what we know. <clears throat> eat the, you know, the, the 10 or 12 things that we always eat. Um, like when we did this uh, mindful eating program um, earlier in the fall, these women, um, they were pregnant women, um, and they had never even heard of quinoa, never eaten, you know, kale, um, just all this stuff which they thought was, you know, just weird kind of outlier food. And so um, when we made food for them, they were like, wow, this is, this is good. Um, and they were really surprised. And also that it was cheap, you know, inexpensive, and... Um, you know, it didn't take a lot of time. So I think showing people and letting people eat food that is good and easy enough to make is educational as well. 
I just wanted to say too, um, you're talking about the nutrition, the education, which I think is all very important, but one thing as a psychologist that really stood out to me in this movie is how he talked about we make 200 decisions a day about our food and so much of it. We don't even process, we don't even realize. I think that's true. Like, that resonates with me, that we don't even just grab what's ever there. And so I think structuring environments so that it's not even choice. Like, like, like we were saying, like, don't even give them the bad food. Just, here's your food. Here's, if we just react, we're social beings, we react to what's around us, what other people are eating, make sure that those are those healthy choices, make sure that grocery stores are structured so that, you know, you don't even think about it. You're just filling up your basket with the healthy food. Like, almost thinking about that psychology, about the behavior, how can we just make it automatic? So we're not trying, we're not fighting against ourselves. We're just going to the grocery store and getting our food and going through the rhythms of our day. So, so that reminds me of a point. Um, and it, it goes back to a little bit of what Paul said um, and Marianne Nessel in the, in the movie. The politics around food are huge. The reason why our grocery stores are set up the way they are is because we know exactly how to place food so that you buy it as a consumer, okay? And the industry is paying an exorbitant amount of money to be able to have their food products placed at the end of the aisle and at eye level. So there is experiments now. We actually have to run these research studies, which seem kind of crazy, you know, to me that we have to prove the da point that if we want people to eat healthier, we need to rearrange how we allow the grocery stores to be set up. Okay, which is crazy when you think about that because who's going to pay for the healthy foods to be arranged in the most optimal places? We don't have any supporters, you know, the industry, the lobbyists for the healthy foods. And I, I'm, I'm using healthy in a very, you know, let's say plant-based foods, okay? I mean, there's just that, that lobbying power is not as big as, for example, the, the Coca-Cola industry, the sweet and sugar sweet beverage industry, okay? So I think one of the other things that we need to learn about um, and this is the reason why, as a public health person and a nutritionist person, I think more education needs to start, we were talking about in schools at the younger level, but also in higher education. Everybody should be taking a course in public health and nutrition. Because the reality is, the more you know about how we're being manipulated by what happens around us, especially with the food, the more we're going to wake up as a society and demand for better things. Right now, we're just responding to the industry's capability of making our food as addictive as it possibly can and placing it in the most strategic way so that when you go into the store, you're going to see that food and you're going to be tempted to buy it. So I originally started out with one question, and then I went on the UVA dining website, and now I have many more. Um, I'm just looking at some of the things that they, they serve. You know, they have glazed carrots, and the second ingredient is margarine, which is one of the things they list in the movie is not good anymore. There's another one that lists uh, high, or partially hydrogenated oils. There are just various things that they do list in the ingredients of the food that they're serving to first years, which don't have uh, much choice in what they're eating. So even if they're going for glazed carrots or something that they consider to be healthy, it's not really the case. The, the, the question that sort of led me uh, to the UVA dining website was um, just, I, I've had a few friends, students, so I, I TA a couple classes, um, who have asked me things about uh, how to sort of get more information about the, serve, the, the food served in dining halls. Because a lot of times they want to know the exact ingredients that are in the food that they're being served. Those ingredient lists don't exist. Um, so I've actually reached out multiple times to UVA Dining to figure out why that's the case. Um, they just shouldn't be, uh, surprises are fun, except for when it's with your food. Um, and so I, I guess, I don't know if I have a question or if I'm just complaining about the, about the, the lack of clarity. Um, 
sort of in, in what first years in particular, and everyone who eats at those dining halls, but first years who don't have uh, the ability to make the choice. They can't drive to the grocery store, they can't buy all of uh, organic kale, um, single ingredient items. They have, they're sort of under the um, UVA dinings. Uh, So, a, a lot of my colleagues on the panel um, respond to maybe some of the specifics, but let me say this. Um, I, I work real, very closely with uh, the folks from UVA Dining, and um, I like to say to people, it's not your father's Aramark, right? And what I mean by that is, yeah, it's still Aramark. Um, the people here, uh, and I will tell you their names, Matt Smythe is the director of UVA Dining, Matt Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H-E, um, Samantha Jameson is the Director of Sustainability. I work closely with both of them. They, and, and, and if, if they will get back to you, which they will, you can send an email with me. They, they're committed to answering your questions. They're committed to um, working towards the kind of transparency that I think we share as, uh, as a value. And so I want to say that on you because, first of all, complaining about dining, Right at college, that's like that goes back almost to Mr. Jefferson. Right, we all did it. Right, we all complained about uh, about dining. So that that's an important part of the college experience, absolutely. Um, but we we should also be holding uh, UVA dining accountable. And when you've got questions, when you've got concerns, voice that. Okay. So I just I I, I can't emphasize enough how much I think we need to, and students need to, um, wh whether it's we want more vegan options, we want more locally or humanely sourced uh, meat or eggs or dairy, to the, this, is, this is a big company, um, and they respond to their customers. And the only way we're gonna get changes is to get those customers speaking in a clear voice. Does anyone want to jump in on that? Okay. Well, I'll only add the fact that um, part of the Food Sustainability Task Force has been actually trying to increase the, the amount of locally produced foods and incorporating those foods um, and providing more plant-based options across the university. So there really has been a push. I've only been here two years. I can't speak to what's happened before that. But I know that I've been impressed by the amount of care and um, collaboration that's been going on between sustainability office, those of us interested in food and nutrition, as far as faculty goes, the students that are involved with that task force, and we have UVA dining as well, as well as um, Darden, right? Because Darden has their own dining services. And the other one that I would actually like to add in here is the hospital, mm -hmm. because that's my biggest pet peeve, is as being a nutritionist and having worked in the hospital, I hate hospitals just because I don't like people being sick, I want everybody to be healthy, is that's our prime opportunity to be able to teach people really how to eat well. And we don't take opportunity to do that. And so I think we still have a lot of room for improvement in all of those areas, and we encourage those of you who are interested to come and be a part of the solution so that we can sort of help make movements. Because it does take a while for us to make those strides, but I think with the more involvement with everybody, we can actually do a better job. Yeah, I'm not, I don't uh, work at the University of the High School, so I'm not really um, familiar, but I remember when I was studying sustainability and we looked past, because a lot of times you'll just blame the um, university or the hospitals, but sometimes just putting your voice louder to the actual um, catering companies like Aramark and USA Foods, people don't realize how much of an influence that they have over the, over the universities. So really trying to, um, you know, in addition, definitely addressing, you know, the university concerns and the hospitals, but also, you know, really taking a larger step and just coming together to, to try to reach those catering companies that um, you'll be surprised at how much of an influence they have over huge um, food, service, food service corporations. Can I just add one thing? Yes. To, to one suggestion, I don't have any, you know, explanation of any of this. 
Um, the Office of Sustainability has a subcommittee uh, called the Civic Engagement Committee. Uh, uh, the, the, the sustainability efforts has a subcommittee called the Civic Engagement Committee. Uh, and this is a committee I sit on with, you know, about 20 other, you know, faculty and staff and tons of students. Uh, it's a lot of people. Uh, but one of the things that we've tried to do is develop a platform for students to create initiatives where they can get engaged and interrogate their experience. Uh, so one of the things I would recommend, if you have students who are really interested in a project like this, we do have funds available. Uh, and we have resources available so the students can develop this project and move it forward. Uh, because ultimately that could become a platform for something larger uh, where we're starting to talk about a broad transparency. So if you want, you can take my email down. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, it's Dr. D-R, who? H-O-O, at virginia.edu. How, how amazing is that? You know, when I came as a doc student, the first thing I did was register that alias, you know, about 15, 16 years ago. Uh, but it's, it works out now. But Dr. Who at Virginia.edu, just have them email me and I'll connect them to the people who can help them uh, figure out what platform to use, what resources they can take advantage of to get at what you're describing. And with that, I want to say thank you to all of you who have stayed. I want to say thank you to our panelists and thank you to um, the Food Film Forum that actually allows for these movies and pays for these movies. And um, I hope you have a wonderful evening and that you make a commitment and you allow us to send it back to you in, in a few weeks to remind you of how you can live a healthier life. Thank you so much.